very much, and thanks everyone for coming down to Art After Hours. Um, it's a great opportunity to sit underneath the artwork that we're going to be discussing today, and it's uh, 50 metres long or a little bit over, and there's 60,000 plastic pieces of bunting here. So it's the biggest artwork ever installed in the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and I think uh, Nikki has an even bigger story to tell than this artwork. So uh, we look forward to getting right into that, hearing about what actually uh, first inspired her to make the type of art she makes at the age of 14, what sh she went through in her 20s to really get her artwork off the ground, and then how she came to bring you this work called Rally. Um, yeah, my name is Tom Tilly, <coughs> uh, an interviewer, a reporter, presenter on Triple J, and um, I have a show at 5.30 in the afternoons where I talk to all kinds of people. Um, and yeah, it's a real privilege to, to talk to Nikki. And also, I spoke before this to the group Contempo, which is sort of like the, the youth wing of uh, the New South Wales Art Gallery membership, like Triple J is the youth wing of the ABC. And they seem to be really excited to have funded this work here that we're sitting underneath. And uh, Nikki, who I spoke to in depth last night before doing this chat, is also really excited to be commissioned to do this work. What was it like when you first found out that they wanted you to do this? What was it like? Oh, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it, it's a fantastic opportunity and it, it kind of fell from the sky and it, it was very, very fast turnaround because normally um, you have to wait a couple of years for, for, for something to eventuate like this. Um, so it was, you know, it was really wonderful. You told me that um, you're not at all a morning person, but actually you had to get up at like 4 or 5 a.m. for three weeks to put this up. How involved were you in this work and the installation of it? Were you putting up every single piece? Uh, no. <laughs> um, it's important to, to be on deck because um, with a work this large, it, it was like the, really the first time that I would have installed it. So I needed to be here um, to help out, to be part of the team, because it's actually a lot of fun. The crew here at the Art Gallery, led by uh, Nick Reith, is just absolutely spectacular, really, really wonderful to, to hang out with. And I actually even said to them, you know, if, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd come and work for you for free. It's so much fun. So um, I wouldn't miss out on that for anything, but also I needed to be on deck to make creative decisions along the way. Yeah. How did you choose which colours to put where and what guided those decisions? Um, well, you, you have a plan to begin with um, and you know, in order to get to that plan there are you know, loads of studies that I had to do, lots of drawings, lots of physical, um, making tiny little markets and whatever. That, that process actually took a very, very long time before I decided um, exactly on the colour scheme. Um, but as we're um, putting the work up, I then had to make a decision as to how to, to bleed the orange into the green, which then goes into the blue. I don't know whether you've noticed, but we've got three different sections here. We've got the, um, the orange and the green and, and the blue, although there's an overall multicoloured field of, of, of colour. Um, but it's how, how do you make that merger without it looking like a flag or, you know, tricolour ice cream. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I kind of had to experiment. I mean, I had an idea of what to do, but I also had to uh, work with it on site. And then at one point, um, Justin was actually the one who uh, um, pointed out that we, we needed to start the blue area a little bit earlier and if I wasn't on site, I wouldn't have known that. So, yeah, very important to be here. How did you make those decisions about where you would fade the colours and, and why they would go to those particular, I guess, meshes of different colours at different points of the room? Well, you had... Oh, it's kind of really boring, Tom. <laughs> but you, kind of, <laughs> you kind of had to... I, I wanted it to be a bleed as opposed to, like, a patch. So... Um, I didn't want the different segments to be sort of stitched together, patched together. I wanted it to be a, like a beautiful, gentle transition. And that, you know, I tried various ways of doing it. It's called Rally, and there's been lots of, um, I guess, different things that, if you take the word literally uh, about rallying politically, there's been lots of different things going on in the world from the global financial crisis um, through to a change of government. 
here more locally in Australia. What does the work mean? Well, um, I don't want the, the meaning of the work to be just the one thing. That's very important to me. Um, my, my work kind of exists in a, in a nebulous state as opposed to a linear state or a one-liner. So if we let the, the title of the work to be taken only in the one way, it'll override all the other meanings, the potential meanings, which are really equally as important to the work. So, you know, when I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. Um, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm, um, I'm feeling your, your emotions. I'm, I'm gauging you. Um, at the same time, simultaneously, I'm, I'm very aware of all the people that are around us and what's going on. You know, it's not, I'm not just listening to you or not just looking at you. Yeah, and that's the way that I kind of um, want my, my art to exist as well on many, many levels in many, many uh, different ways, on many different platforms. We spoke about this last night before we um, came on the stage today is that um, the work was also a homage to your sister who, who passed away at the end of last year. Yeah. How, does, how does she relate to this work? Well, you know, it's all very raw still, and uh, I've got her six-month memorial coming up this weekend, so I really don't want to go into that. But all my work has a, um, like a, uh, a, a private, a private um, meaning for me, and I never normally let it be known. But in this case, I allowed it to be known because um, I wanted this work to be a homage to her. And when I was asked uh, to, to think of a, a, a proposal for the entrance court, um, the first thing that came to mind was I can, I can immortalise my... Because I knew the work was going to go into the collection as well, or more than likely. And I thought I'd really like to do something that would, um, uh, you know, uh, honour honor her memory. Um, and, uh, and, you know, hopefully I have. Yeah, it's interesting to like to hear you describe the work that it has a, you know, it's not in linear in meaning and it has more of a, a nebulous um, uh, kind of impact. What what do you hope someone will feel or, or or think as they walk in and experience this work? Well, what what I try and do is I try and use um, a number of devices with my work to maximise the um, potential meanings that that you could um, get from it. So, because um, I, I, I take into consideration that everyone is different, everyone's unique, and they, they will engage with the work on their own terms. So I use things like, I use devices like color and movement and um, uh, um, you know, other, other kind of um, uh, um, things like, you know, the, 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 the title of the work, for instance, to, to get people in to start thinking about the work in, in some kind of way that they can. So I think on the whole, when people walk in, they, they're immersed in the colour, they're immersed in the movement, and they, they're kind of transported for, uh, for a bit, for a little while, into this other world. And um, they kind of leave whatever they have behind and um, they're walking around and I'm, I'm hoping also because my work also um, is about uh, painting outside of the canvas so I'm also hoping that when people walk in they can see this work as a, as a giant painting or many other paintings the, the fans are moving all the bunting around and as you're moving through the work um, you're, um, you're, you're surrounded by all these potential different paintings in, in, in the making. Um, there's a beautiful Pizarro around the corner over there, a beautiful Impressionist painting, and um, I'm hoping that people will make the connections between that work and this work and see the bunting as hundreds of, uh, of different, thousands of different um, uh, coloured brushstrokes. Um, you know, again, sort of making, uh, uh, paying homage to, um, to the Impressionists and post-Impressionists. Where does this fit into your broader body of work? Because, you know, you've exhibited 
you know, over 160 times. Um, this work has a lot of similarities to a work you did um, in a lame way in the CBD, but also ties in with some of the work you've done in Leeds. So, so where does it fit for you? I've, I've done over 14 series of work, might be 15 now. So I work in, in, in series. And um, this is part of yeah, the, uh, the series where I've replaced the dot with the stripe, or otherwise known my bunting series. <laughs> Um, but it also connects with um, the work that you mentioned in Leeds called Liberty and Anarchy. And um, that work, that, that, that took, uh, it took two years in the making because I had to do a lot of research. I went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York and I hung out in the archives and I researched the, um, uh, the, 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 the first op art exhibition um, ever held there in 1965 and I had a look close up at all the artworks and how they um, worked optically. So um, after I got the information together I then <coughs> engaged um, engineers and mathematicians to come up with a giant walk-in moiré painting basically. So you weave through this work and the work was made out of the same plastic but it went from top to bottom. But the, the significant thing about that work was it wasn't only, it didn't only sort of work in a similar way formally to this work in that, you know, it, it was about painting outside of the canvas and also it was very optical. So as you're sort of moving through, you're creating all these different paintings every time you turn your head by just looking at, at a different part of the work. But um, the actual moiré, the shimmer that was created that I worked out mathematically. Um, also kind of, um, it was like a, a metaphor um, for the dystopia of our times. So um, this work kind of links in with that work um, on, on that sort of, that level. But formally links in also with Rush that was held at, uh, that was put on at um, Bridge Lane. Your real vision for your artwork, you told me, started at, at 14. What was, it, what was that kernel of, of truth in your work that started at that point? Well, I, was, I found out that I was good at something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I enjoyed doing it. And, um, but it was also a form of escape. Um, you know, adolescence can be tough. Um, and it was just really wonderful to escape into this world of art. Um, I came from a very traditional Greek family, very big family, five kids, and uh, uh, there, there were a lot of restrictions on, on, on um, what, what I could do and what I couldn't do in terms of my life, and so I just kind of um, escaped into this, this art making, which I, I found an amazing, an amazing... Uh, you know, not only solace, but an amazing world to, to venture into. Um, so it became part of who I am from back then. And uh, it, it's, it's more of a vocation rather than, than a job, yeah? This isn't something that I've chosen to do. This is something that I, I do and that is part of me. I think that's the difference between Art, um, for the students, I mean, how many of the students from Art Express have actually gone on to art school? And how many of those will then go on to be artists? The ones where it's a choice for them to become an artist, they normally drop out. It's not normally the most talented ones that continue. It's the ones that have a dependence, I suppose, on the um, process of art making, or it's just part of who they are and their being. So it's not a choice to stop. Was there anything that you were doing in those early years, like 14, 15, 16, that's still consistent in your work today? The school that I went to uh, was, was very big on, on, on uh, colour theory and, and exploring colour. That's why the schools are really important, what they teach the students. Kind of, they plant seeds. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you like, touch on, on what makes people go on with their art career from high school through to art school and beyond. Um, and 
I guess, you know, when someone would look at your career and the amount of success that you've had, they'd wonder where did it go after art school and, you know, given that it was so successful, was it a tough ride? And, and you told me that actually it really has been, a, you know, it was a tough ride, particularly in those early days. You were actually a mother at 21 and sometimes working up to six jobs to get through art school. I was a single mother by the time I was 26, 27. So, um, that, yeah, I was working up to six jobs. One of them was actually here. <laughs> There's Leanne. Yeah. Yeah, I worked with Leanne for a bit in the 90s. Um, but yeah, and I, and I took out the garbage and um, cut the sandwiches and took my daughter to school, did the homework, and did all that. And then when she was tucked in bed, I'll then work on my art. So um, it is possible, isn't it? Yeah, totally, especially in your case. I, I wonder if a lot of people facing those same sorts of challenges might have to, you know, not be able to do their art, but somehow you managed to kind of push through and get on with all those duties, including just earning money, putting food on the table and tucking your daughter into bed. What was it that got you through and, and was, there, was there a point where it was touch and go? Um, it, it did get tricky at times. Um, my, my daughter uh, was spectacular at, at art. She almost got a full score for A-level art. And, um, and I naturally thought she would go, and she was also hung in the Young and Art Awards in London. And I naturally thought that she would go on to be an artist. And um, when, when uh, I asked her whether she was or not, she said, well, no. And I said, why? She said, well, I don't want to live like you. Whoa. <laughs> and I said, great. Um, <laughs> and I said, what, what did it for you, actually? Uh, was it when we lived in a car, a rental car, for four days when we were homeless? Um, so there were... Yeah, a couple of times when it was it was a bit dodgy, yeah, and we were almost homeless at Christmas time when it was snowing. So, uh, but I've done great now. Don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where are things up to for you now? You've moved back to Australia um, with your partner. Where do you see your work going and how much work you're doing in conjunction with your international connections? Yeah, well... Um, I remarried, by the way, to a very nice man over there, <laughs> um, who's also an artist. Great move. <laughs> um, but um, I, uh, my daughter's in London, and she's recently gotten engaged. And she's um, not coming back. Sorry. She's not coming back, is she? She is. She <laughs> is. She said she would. <laughs> she wants me to raise her kids. <laughs> um, but. We've got, um, we've got a home in London, and we've got a home here. Um, and uh, I'm very, we're very close to my daughter. So we visit her as often as we can, and that's quite often, because I've also had a lot of work in London, the UK, because I've got a bit of a foothold there. So, um, yeah, I've got my wardrobe there, my wardrobe here. I've got my husband here, I've got my kid over there. It's great. Well, it's my oyster. Totally. What are the other, what's the other series that you're working on at the moment that you're partway through? I've got an exhibition on at Arc One Gallery in Melbourne. So I finished putting that show up in Melbourne and then got on the plane, came here and was up at 4am the next day to start installing this. So um, that show is, is different to this work. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a new, new series, completely new series of work where I'm, I'm working with prints um, and also with mental imaging. Um, it's a whole other story though. So I've got that, I've got a number of things going on all at the same time. Okay, and just finally, what's it like for you to have so many people come in and experience this work here in the New South Wales Art Gallery? What's it like? What's it like? Oh, it's, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, and you, you know, it's a great honour. I don't have to tell you that. It's a wonderful, tremendous um, opportunity and honour to have something like this installed. I mean, if it wasn't for the Art Gallery of New South Wales, the Contempo Group, um, this work wouldn't exist. And you need, you need organisations and people to offer this kind of opportunity for this kind of art to exist. You can do paintings move, there's, there's a market for paintings. But um, 
for installation work, you do need, need this kind of support, and you also need the support of um, organisations like the Australia Council. Um, I owe a lot to the Australia Council and for the assistance they've given me over the years. Yeah. Nikki, thanks so much for speaking to us. Okay, thank you, Tim.